Okay, students, I think we are going. Okay, good. This will be lecture, th lecture three. And uh, so we are going to be looking at a, a very important um, concept and uh, with metamaterials and that is going to be how um, power flows in a metamaterial which we've already covered to a certain degree with the uh, negative index of refraction but we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that concept and uncover an extraordinary an extraordinary uh, property of metamaterials that had been debated ever since it was proposed uh, with Sir um, Pendry. He's uh, one of the founders of metamaterials and discovered a lot of very interesting properties of metamaterials and uh, we're going to talk about one key discovery that he made that really sparked a debate that lasted at least eight years and to some degree is still unsettled um, as it concerns to power with and power flow within a metamaterial but also energy density um, uh, group, group velocity and uh, other electromagnetic aspects we'll talk about in this lecture so um, let's look at this uh, so Let's look at the flow of energy in metamaterials. We know it's given by the pointing vector, which by now with a double negative material, a, mater a metamaterial namely, uh, double negative means it has both epsilon and mu being negative. We know that S is in the opposite direction of the wave vector K, thus the flow of the energy is in the opposite direction of the um, advance, advancing of the wave fronts. That's fine, we did that last time. So now let's write down uh, the pointing theorem for. Um, can I do that? Okay, there we go. For harmonic fields, so complex uh, po uh, pointing's comp theory for complex and harmonic fields, uh, we have we have this right here, and. <clears throat> So that's what, in Jackson, what edition do I have of Jackson? I have it, Jackson's uh, third edition. So in, so in this third edition, this equation is 6.134, straight out of Jackson, um, where this is going to be different than the Marquez book, uh, because this is going to be, as, is, as it should be, the outward pointing um, normal vector of the surface that encloses this volume. All right. Um, so Marquez uses the inward pointing normal vector. So that's just one thing to keep. No, but I kind of like to go back and use the tried and true, uh, or the, the convention, which is the outward pointing normal vector for the enclosed volume. So S, of course, um, is 1 half E cross H prime. We're working with complex fields at this point. And so with the complex fields, um, we have that this equation, with the, importantly, with the minus in here. All right? Very important. Minus. Indeed, that's not a typo. That is a minus. So, uh, and both of these are pretty much what you would expect, the 1 fourth uh, E dot D star and the 1 fourth B dot H star. And the extra factor of a half is to is because of the uh, time harmonic aspect. So, so that's that. So now we're going to look at the power going into the system. All right. So we're going to take over uh, the uh, this over to the other side, and we're going to put in a minus here, such that this then represents the power going into the system. And we're gonna we want the real part uh, of that, so we take the real part um, and uh, of, of both sides, all right. And so we're going to eventually look at source-free uh, volume. So this is going to be zero because really we should have put in real here as well. Um, but uh, we have the i right in here, so to get the real part, we have to take the imaginary part, 
obviously, of this. All right. So that's where you see that we're okay with the minus sign in here. It doesn't, it shouldn't cause you all that much concern, um, because uh, because we're looking uh, we're looking at the real uh, part, and so the imaginary is uh, of this when of this volume integral, and both of these for lossless materials, uh, the volume integral. Is entirely real, so there is no matching part. So this whole side is, this whole thing is zero, uh, because we only have a real part here. Taking the imaginary of a real part is zero. All right. So when there is no sources, when there is no dissipation, uh, the amount of energy flowing into the volume needs to be zero. That's what you get. So that's all fine. All right. Um, but we do have dissipation. All right. So that's what we're going to have to say. So in a source-free region, when j is equal to 0, uh, the equation reduces down to this right here. All right. So um, when we do have dissipation within the material, we have to be, uh, and, and these are not time varying. So, um, so we have a certain amount of energy, uh, the rate of energy uh, being absorbed in the material. So this is positive. Uh, this has to be positive, uh, meaning that we're feeding energy in to keep the, the field strengths at, the, at a constant value, all right? Even though we have dissipation. So we have to feed energy. Those two things have to be equal. Uh, the amount of energy lost due to dissipation has to be equal to the amount of energy we're feeding into the system. All right. Um, so uh, and so then, if j is equal to zero, we have this, and the left hand side must be greater than zero, uh, since the right hand side is the dissipative. So this has to be greater than zero. Uh, so this has to be greater than zero, and we're going to flip these around. Uh, this uh, we're going to flip this and this around, so that we put the magnetic thing. Uh, Thing first, and so if this is greater than zero, but we take the minus out, uh, this thing has to be less than zero. All right, all right, that's fine. So and then we take a look at this. Um, well, so if we want this to be less than zero, we should really have both uh, being less than zero. That means uh, imaginary. So we bring in the imaginary to both terms here and bring it within inside the integral because we have a homogeneous material within this volume. All right. Um, so this is certainly positive, this right here, um, and real. So we don't get any imaginary part from that. So that leaves uh, the responsibility of this being less than zero to mu. So the imaginary of mu has to be less than zero. All right, same thing here. Uh, but we have the minus sign here. Um, we have the minus sign right here. So, so um, that means that imaginary epsilon star has to be greater than zero. If the imaginary epsilon star is greater than zero, that, uh, of course, imaginary epsilon is less than zero. All right? If that sound immediately clear, uh, prove that to yourself in two seconds, three seconds, however long it takes you. Okay? So, um, so we need to have both of these. Uh, imaginary mu is less than zero, and imaginary epsilon is less than zero. All right? Uh, uh, those being negative. All right. So, so then we say, go back and say, okay, so certainly both of those are negative. Both of those are negative. We are now going to investigate trying to have the other two aspects of mu and epsilon being negative, namely the real parts of epsilon uh, and the real part of mu being negative. So let's try to have all of these less than zero. Okay, and then let's see what happens. Let's see why this is so important. Okay, well. So we go back and, and look at k. k squared is equal to omega squared mu epsilon. All right. 
So writing k in terms of its real and imaginary part and squaring it out, this is what we get. So uh, expanding both sides, we get this and this. And we can collect both the real part, but especially the imaginary part. So we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at this, along with the uh, omega squared out here. So we have 2k real times imaginary is equal to this. All right. So k imaginary, dividing through both, both sides by 2 over k real, is equal to this. So then we take a look at this, and we say, all right, well, within a metamaterial, we're aiming to have... Um, mu relative and epsilon rel I mean real these are real okay so that's a fault in my not a fault a weakness in my notation because quite often with uh, epsilon and mu you you write it as um, epsilon relative times epsilon not all right um, and then in that case the lowercase r refers to um, the relative epsilon relative to what epsilon naught is. In this case, um, as we've as we've done, as I've tried to make clear, that epsilon, in fact, I, I write it down right here, um, that the epsilon sub r in this case, it denotes the real part of epsilon. Okay, so there should be no confusion. But we want both of those to be less than zero, less than zero, all right? And above, we've shown that these are less than zero. So in a metamaterial, uh, this product and this product is always positive, and therefore the sum of uh, two positive numbers are also is also positive. So we we then have two. So this whole thing in parentheses is positive. So we then and of course omega squared is positive. Of course two is positive. So we have two cases then. Case one, where uh, k sub r is greater than zero. Uh, and this is greater than zero, all of these other things are positive, therefore k imaginary has to be greater than zero. Okay. And case two is when uh, kr is less than zero, um, then k sub i also has to be less than zero. All right. Case one and case two. All right. So let's look at um, case one. So let's see why the prior result is so weird. Um, And um, so, did I spell weird right? It seems weird. Um, I think, okay, yeah. So case one represents um, with a positive case of R, uh, with our notation of E to the I omega T, everything has a time dependence of E to the I omega T. Therefore, a positive case of R represents a positive propagating wave with this time dependence. That's different than what Jackson uses. They, and he always uses a minus i omega t. All right. Then a positive propagating wave would be one in which you have the have a, a this coming inside would be a plus. All right. But not not for uh, Marquez, and that's kind of the notation we're following. So so a positive case of R represent uh, represents a positive propagating wave. So we write that out. So we have a positive case of R here, but we have the minus. So this is this represents a positive propagating wave, or more accurately, a wave propagating in the positive x direction. All right. But we see that the waves have this dependence right here. Now, if you look at this, red flags should go off in your mind. Because as the wave goes to more positive x values, let's see. Uh, as the wave goes to more positive x values, y m then I guess you don't need this. Seems like my video is not working, but uh, hopefully it's recording sound. I think it is. So you don't need to necessarily see me. So as the um, wave go, going to more positive x values, it's growing because we don't have a minus in here. We have a plus. All right. So thus, as the wave propagates naturally down the x direction in this naturally dissipated material, um, it's actually growing. It's actually growing exponentially. 
So that's extraordinarily odd. So the uh, fields uh, are getting stronger. So at that point, you really have to wonder if this whole thing with the materials has been proven wrong simply because of this result. So this is go going to be the big result for this lecture because it's so incredibly important, so incredibly um, bizarre, such that for folks not as smart or persistent uh, as Vazlago, he would have then dismissed this material as being unphysical. Um, but he didn't. And that's because this turns out to be allowed. All right, case two. Case two, when kx is negative, then, then that negative will cancel out with the negative in front of the i to make a positive there. And then you have this dependence where we take the magnitude of case of uh, i in case of imaginary, and you have this. So this represents a uh, wave propagating in the minus x direction. And, um, but then we see the same thing. So as the wave propagates in the minus x direction, it's growing in strength exponentially. It's growing exponentially in strength. So the question is, does this violate conservation of energy? Does it violate uh, causality? Does it violate conservation of information? Any one of those. And... Um, so uh, that was the big debate is say, well, these fields, you actually send in a, send in a wave to a, a metamaterial. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, within the metamaterials, you see that the field is increasing. So that, you know, uh, that causes enormous concern about conservation of energy. Are you creating energy within a device? And the debate is still out there, really, because, um, yeah, it's extraordinarily interesting. So, um, so we'll do some homework problems on that. So, uh, obviously, uh, this is the big, big uh, debate. And so the generally accepted answer right now is no. And as Marquez states on page 52, evanescent modes do not carry energy. Thus, amplification, although striking, is not forbidden by conservation of energy. Okay, so um, that's the general result right now. Okay. Um, all right. So before we apply these results to obvious applications, namely lenses, uh, and we'll do that uh, next lecture, um, let's finish up on the development and analysis of the electromagnetic properties of metamaterials. So uh, we still have a few more things to get through. Um, certainly, that was the big result for the day, uh, this thing here. Okay. Uh, that is something difficult to swallow. Uh, you really have to chew on this and think about that. And what I want you to think about is all the situations where you think that must violate conservation of energy um, because you're then able to do blank and then fill in the blank and then see where the holes are in your argument. All right. But before, so, but let's cover at least one more thing. Uh, there's a few more odds and ends even after this that I'll probably cover in lecture four. But let's at least cover energy density and also dispersion. Um, so energy density leads us to dispersion because what we see in introductory EM textbooks, generally the energy density is given by uh, this equation right here. All right? Um, and uh, this equation right here, where uh, the electric energy density and the magnetic energy densities are given by those two things. But if epsilon and mu are negative, then that equation predicts that UE and or UM are negative. And this is unphysical. All right? What is 
uh, a negative energy density. All right. So um, it's unphysical is the general argument. But again, I'm going to have you uh, I'm going to have you think about that and then see are there cases where you can think of negative energy densities. Interesting. Um, but uh, the argument within electromagnetics and that materials is that it's unphysical. Therefore, uh, they uh, say, well, okay, so um, of course, uh, metamaterials do not use this equation because this equation is only used when uh, epsilon and mu do not vary with frequency, namely when they are not dispersive. Uh, something is uh, said to be dispersive, a material is said to be dispersive when epsilon and mu, one or both, depend on frequency. If uh, they depend on frequency, the, the accurate, the correct formula you need to use for energy density is this. All right, again in Jackson, uh, but also in Marquez. Uh, and then you see that instead of epsilon, in front, you have this partial derivative of uh, omega epsilon. All right. Um, same thing with mu. So it's those uh, that have to be positive to create positive energy densities. So those have to be positive. Therefore, um, you can carry out this in integral, um, product rule, and get these two conditions right here. Those two conditions. Fine. So those have to be positive. And so what you see is um, if you ever want to have a dispersionless material where epsilon does not vary with frequency, um, then, then, you, then you have to have, uh, so then uh, this is zero if this is a constant. And so your, and epsilon, uh, so the zero has to be greater than your minus epsilon over omega. All right. So for positive epsilons, you're allowed for that. You can you can provide that because a zero is always greater than say minus two over epsilon. But for a uh, metamaterial with epsilon being negative, um, then you'll have say a minus two. A minus two times minus is two. And so, uh, for some omegas, uh, this could be violated if your slope is zero. All right? And so that shows that epsilon has to be a function of frequency for a metamaterial. All right? Okay. Um, so if you, if you have a negative epsilon, say a negative two, you get rid of the minus sign, you just simply um, do that. Um, take that absolute magnitude, cancel out the minus signs. So uh, let's use these results to calculate another very important property, uh, namely the relationship between the phase velocity and the group velocity. All right, within this k squared is equal to omega squared mu epsilon. We, we take one omega and uh, come up and uh, put it next to mu, and then another omega and uh, put it next to epsilon. And then take the deriv partial derivative with respect to omega using the product rule. We get this. Um, this right here is 2k dk d omega, which k over omega is equal to 1 over v phase, phase velocity. dk d omega is 1 over vg. So if we divide through both, uh, both sides by omega, so divide by omega, divide this side by omega. Um, we get we get uh, two over v phase v g. Now, if we divided through by omega, really we should be uh, v should be out of there. Um, then we have epsilon d omega uh, d omega mu over d omega, and then mu times d omega epsilon over d um, omega. So um, what we see here is that uh, these are negative uh, for a metamaterial, uh, and uh, these are positive for a metamaterial. So the whole thing is negative. 
So d over v, g v p is less than zero, or v p v g is less than zero. So uh, when you have the, f what this says is that when you have a wave packet, such that the envelope of the wave is going in one direction, the individual phase fronts of the waves within that wave packet are going in the opposite direction. Therefore, it's less than zero here, uh, compared to uh, or relative to the direction of propagation of the envelope overall. So that's just what this says. Hence, with the wave packet in a metamaterial, the phase of each wave travel within the packet travels in the opposite direction as the envelope. Um, and which is the, the direction of the envelope is also uh, uh, the direction of travel of the energy flow of the energy. Okay, one last thing. Kramer's uh, Kroning relation. If real epsilon, epsilon r, is less than zero, then will, there will necessarily be loss within the metamaterial. Necessarily be loss within the metamaterial. All right, this is a direct consequence of the Kramer, Kramer's Kroning relation. So uh, this, these relations give a relationship between the imaginary and the real parts of uh, the permittivity. And, and also permeability, all right? So, um, and the imaginary is this right here, all right? When epsilon relative, uh, epsilon real is equal to epsilon naught, then you see that you have one minus one or zero, principal values of the integral of zero from zero to infinity is zero, and you get, you can then have epsilon imaginary being zero. But when epsilon uh, relative is a negative value, then you'll have negative minus negative, and you'll have a non-zero number up here. And the principal value of that is not zero. You will get an imaginary component to epsilon. And in, always, when you have a negative part of epsilon, uh, uh, when you have neg a negative value for epsilon real, you will always have a non-zero um, epsilon imaginary. Therefore, you will always have loss. And this is a big problem in metamaterials because you will always have loss within the system. Hence, we see that if epsilon re uh, real, which is certainly a function of frequency, is negative, then there will necessarily be absorption within the material. And so that's bad. So two things, uh, three things. Um, Waves are amplified as they go through a material, but the, uh, the, that amplification doesn't imply conservation of energy. Or, um, and in fact, uh, we can skip ahead to point number three, that in fact we inherently have loss within the material in a metamaterial. You can't avoid that. So how do you combine those two things together? Well, they're evanescent waves. So, uh, so uh, evanescent waves don't carry energy. So the, the third item that we just covered, this right here, says that, well, we're going to be losing energy, certainly, in the material. It's unavoidable. But the field, uh, field strengths of those evanescent waves are exponentially growing. Bullet point uh, item number two, uh, important item point number two, was that we always have dispersion right here. So three big important things in this relatively short lecture. Um, field, um, wave, waves and metamater evanescent waves and metamaterials grow exponentially. Um, you always have dispersion and you always have loss in the metamaterial. And that's that. So I, within a short lecture, we have three incredibly important properties of metamaterials. So with that, I will end this lecture and then assign a homework. Right, take care.